you think it's an impossible connection between this phenomena and reincarnation? And what? Reincarnation. Well, we talked a little bit this morning about the relationship of these ideas to, to death and how shamans claim that they're seeing into a world of souls. Um, I don't know. I find it... The thing which really got me is the presence of these English-speaking entities in the trance. I mean, that I did not expect. I, from Jung and from Freud, you expect residual memories, and, but not these entities, these beings. And then the question is, where are they? Who are they? Well, a conservative... The, the possibilities are fairly limited. They are either dead people because they are clearly more like people than like animals. They, after all, speak and communicate and have intentionality in a purely intellectual realm. So that means they're like people, but they're not like anybody you've ever seen. So are they dead people? That's one possibility. Or are they extraterrestrials? Well, that's another possibility, but the problem is we've never seen an extraterrestrial. We've got dead people all over the place. <laughs> we know that there are dead people, but we don't know if anything survives bodily death. Well, then the other source is, are they from the future? Are they future people? We see people now, so we can extrapolate there must be people in the future. They might be different from us, Perhaps they could come back. So those are the fairly uncomfortable and limited choices. They're either an advanced state of humanity, they're the souls of the dead, or they're some kind of extraterrestrial dwellers in a parallel continuum. Well, now you're supposed to generate hypotheses conservatively. That means that the dead lead by a mile. <laughs> just by logical deduction. So the strangest hypothesis turns out to be the least, the most likely that these are the souls of the dead and, that, and it's possible that reincarnation is something where at a certain point in historical time we find out about it. We learn literally the secrets of death. I mean, this would be big news it would be quite a surprise to the forward thrust of scientific rationalism if what it was going to lead to was a communicate opening a communication line to the uh, ancestors. You see, for instance, uh, use of psychedelics moving in a ceremonial or ritual fashion in a way of creating new ways of coming together as people to heal that circle of the shield. Well, where it's most enduring, I think this is how it ends up being done. People do the w work on their own, but then they tend to form into circles. This is how I think the serious psychedelic voyaging gets done, because the circle gives people permission and courage. If we had an unbroken cultural tradition, we would be initiated by master shamans as it is, we've had to sort of reinvent the whole of the world's oldest religion. And we haven't done that bad a job. I mean, we shouldn't feel that we have to fault ourselves. The anthropological literature of the world is vast. And if you spend time with it, you will know more about these things on a certain level than most people in a traditional culture. It was very interesting being in the Amazon. You would go with the people and, and they would show you their plants and then and it might come up that you would say, did you know that the Conibo, who live 50 miles away from you, also use this plant and they call it X? And they would just be astonished. Say, how do you know this? Well, you couldn't explain that you had read it in a Harvard Museum botanical leaflet. <laughs> but that was how you knew it. You knew it because you'd done your homework. So what they had was 
tremendous vertical initiation into one culture. But what you can bring to this that is very useful and respected is a tremendous general knowledge about this. Say, well, did you know that in Africa people use the same plant and they do it like this? Or did you know that in Indonesia similar practices are going on? And so we've reconstructed a shamanism. But from then spending time with ayahuasqueros in the, in the Amazon and other kinds of shamans in other places, I really... Th- see that it wasn't as formal as we thought. Uh, There are rituals and songs and techniques, but the spirit of shamanism is uh, open-minded and open-ended. And these people are really doing this out of curiosity to find out the, the myth Uh, the mythological structures created by any kind of shamanic uh, system are largely for the consumption of the client, not the shaman. The shaman knows that this is all provisional. And what we found with the shamans in the Amazon was great curiosity, great willingness to try out novel concepts, to integrate weird ideas into their own cosmology, electromagnetism, uh, viruses, computers. They loved all these things because they saw them as metaphors that they could integrate into their visions. The flying saucer is a metaphor like this, very strong in the ayahuasca uh, mythology. Liz, did you want to say something? You said earlier today or yesterday sometimes, you guess what happens when I write things down, the domain in which we operate lies within our minds. And I'd like to know how that, I'm always confused about real and not real. All these realities you've been describing with little elves, et cetera, et cetera, is that within your mind? And is the English because that's the language you're most familiar with? Well, I think what I meant when I said the domains in which we operate are all within our minds is that inside culture, it's all whatever we say it is. In other words, other than that it's day and night, nature doesn't say much to us. We pursue our activities all inside uh, a a construct of culture that comes out of language. So that's what I meant when I said that it's all within the domain of our minds. I mean, it's all within the hu- the, um, the human world and potentially affected by the human mind. The problem of real and unreal, which is supposed to be a naive problem, is one I have too. I think that... Um, the real world is so strange that it's just t- t- almost too freakish to suppose. You know, I quote all the time J.B.S. Haldane, who said, the world is not only stranger than we suppose, it's stranger than we can suppose. This is a tremendous liberation once you grab onto it. It's really true. I mean, how many of you know that? That, that it's really true that the world at any moment could come completely and utterly apart. And have you seen that happen? You know, I, I, it, that's really what I'm concerned to communicate, is the provisional nature of reality. It does have a certain momentum, and thank God for it, because, you know, who could stand it if it were always coming unglued? But on the other hand, you know, if you're an edge runner, if you keep poking, there are these things you can do, and then it just springs to pieces. And I don't say it's all lies. It doesn't seem to operate in the domain of truth and lies. It's just that this is all just such a limited slice to what's possible. Um, That was very liberating for me to find out. I remember the first time I smoked DMT, and when I came down, they practically had to hog-tie me. And all I could say was, I can't believe it. 
I cannot believe it. And I couldn't. I still can't. I mean, my whole, the whole impetus for my career is to convince myself that somebody else has seen the same thing and that they can't believe it either. Uh, because, you know, it's so weird that it always floats to the top. It always calms down and turns back into this, you know, rooms full of people sitting, listening. But <laughs> beneath that, beneath that is just this really unspeakably bizarre thing, not as we're told it should be. Not, in fact, as we're told it isn't. The one thing they tell you it isn't, it is. It is. It is made of magic. Anything can happen. I mean, these to have elves by the thousands pouring into your apartment, how can a rational... Uh, what is a person to do with that? You know, because it's, it's that what happens is that in a single moment, in the privacy of your own reality, it's revealed to you that all of history is a mistake, a delusion, a horrible misunderstanding, but you're given no evidence, only the conviction that this is so. And then you're set down among your fellows and they don't know what you're talking about, can't understand why you've become so agitated and addled. And I think this is what we all as psychedelic people live with, and we suspect each other. We can't be sure that anybody has ever really seen the true uh, naked heart of the stone but ourselves. And so then it's this tremendous catalyst to language, to try and build metaphors, to try and get the nod of recognition so that we are satisfied. Uh, it's not really stranger than the real world, would you say? <laughs> it is the real world. I mean, in the so-called real world. <laughs> I mean, that's well. It's more brightly colored. It's moving faster. Why is it so brightly colored? Why is it moving faster? I mean, what I've noticed in my, my DMT experiences, and, and when I realized this, it was with a certain amount of horror. Was you break into this space, it's dome-like, it's warm, it's diffusely lit. There are all these self-transforming machine elves and their toys, which also are singing and condensing and making objects and so forth and so on. The whole thing is like triggers just wonder, cascades of wonder. But then... I realized after seeing this several times and trying to pay attention and hold my mind steady that this is someone's idea of a reassuring environment for human beings. It is, in fact, literally a playpen of some sort. Well, that means that I'm not seeing who's ever on the other side. I am emerging into an artificial construct of some sort, entirely their creation. Well, then it just begins to lift this veil, and, and there's this howling begins, and you just begin to fall forward into it, and you realize, you know, it is the Sephiroth and the Shekinah. It is the howling between the worlds. But it is approached through an infinite number of veils that reassure coddle, control, confine. But it, you can move toward it as fast as you dare. But it is entirely transforming and entirely real. It was a, it was a great um, realization for me to understand that there was no limit to how far you could go. That we all make a certain choice once you discover psychedelics, always before that, spiritual progress is, uh, you know, grunt work. Suddenly, you're standing on ice cubes in terms of uh, spiritual progress and how you make it. How do you control it? And the answer is most people go a certain distance and then give up, get off, stand there and talk about it. 
But there's nothing holding any of us back from becoming unrecognizable, not only to our friends and loved ones, but to ourselves. You know the stories told of the Taoist guy up on Cold Mountain and he's been up there 25 years and occasionally people see him and yes, he's still alive. Well, any one of us could become that person, could march off into a dimension of magical narcissism so alien to the concerns of other people that we would have to go and live up on the crags and in the mist and eat bird nests or whatever they do up there, you know. Well, so then that puts a whole different light on the spiritual quest because it means that you're, we're holding it back rather than lashing it forward to ever greater exertion. And I think that's the proper, uh, the proper attitude because the depth of spirit is infinite and in its benevolence toward suffering humanity, it has made itself available in infinite amounts. So then it's for us to <clears throat> somehow come to terms with this. It's like having a, a living religion. It is having a living religion because it's having an infinite source of gnosis, of understanding uh, available. Somebody, yes. Wilbur has recently written about meditation as a preview to death. He says that it conditions you to, to enter the bardo so you won't shy away from the and go into it fully. Do you see any role in, of meditation as a preparation for psychedelics? Or, or would you just talk about meditation and your opinion of it in general? Well, it teaches you to sit still, which is a precondition for psychedelics. I mean... You know, um, keeping still is one of the hexagrams of the I Ching. People often ask the question you asked, or in slightly different forms, they say, well, isn't there another way to get there? Is it so narrow? Is it so specific to these plants? And, you know, the truth is, I don't know. I'm not an expert. All I know is based on my experience. In my experience... These things can only be approached this way and who would want to approach them any other way? I mean, we don't want this to become so generalized that by closing your eyes and ripping off a few om tat sats, you fall into the kind of states I'm talking about. I mean, that would be extremely unwelcome and nearly uh, pathological. I don't understand this problem with how you achieve it uh, to my mind, obviously you can't do it by yourself. Obviously you can't do it on the natch because it's a meeting with another entity. There has to be an other and it has to be objectified even if it's as a plant or a mushroom. So basically how I read these meditation texts is they um, teach you about psychological phenomena they teach you what you may see when you close your eyes and sit for days and watch. Uh, the thing about meditation in my own experience is that it's just tremendously boring. However, everything you're doing will be very useful to you when you take a psychedelic. Then it works. Then there is this flow of imagery I am maybe a very lumpen person, but that's all right because a lot of us are lumpen and I wish to speak for that slice. There may be supreme aesthetes balanced on such razor's edge of metabolic peculiarity that at every moment they are at one with the mystery. But that butter is no bread for the rest of us, you know. We're trying to create a kind of democratic consensus here about this stuff. And it seems to me the plants were put there for this purpose, and they achieve it so easily. I mean, I practiced yoga at times in the past and <clears throat> had some amount of success with triggering exotic psychological states, but they were very difficult 
and time consuming and then they always told you that wasn't what it was about anyway and you were becoming distracted by phenomena well why bridle then at just chowing down on five grams of mushrooms with the knowledge that you know you'll be fine in 12 hours so it's really a matter of using the tools there are all kinds of altered states, weird states, uh, states of sexual abstinence and states of various kinds of agitation and this and that. But what I'm interested in is just this very specific set of phenomena, and I don't really make any claim for it to say, you know, this is the spiritual path. I don't say that. What I say is this is the most interesting thing around. Uh, and uh, but it's very specific for instance I don't like drugs which mess with your mind in the sense of that distort your your value assessing ability uh, the drug which comes to mind is ketamine ketamine is an extremely powerful synthetic drug that creates a an experience which if you haven't had ketamine you don't know what this experience is it's that specific to it but hell the house could burn down around you and it would arrive as an unconfirmable rumor on the dark side of your metaphysical imagination with this <laughs> stuff I mean you would never lift a hair it would never enter your mind that there was a problem Detura is like this too Detura severely distorts reality. The day I knew that my experiments with Detura had come to an end was one day in Nepal. I was talking to a friend of mine in the market about his Detura experiments and how much he'd been taking recently. And in the course of the conversation, it came out that he thought we were in his apartment. <laughs> And I realized, looking at this poor soul, that there had been severe degradation of core information processing and that, you know, we had to get back on the wagon or we weren't going to uh, get out of there. But now, but so then, do, let me describe for a moment the, the state of mind on DMT is... If you keep your... There is a tendency to give way to absolute astonishment. But if you can hold that back and pay very close attention to what's going on, you will discover that it didn't do anything to you. That here you are and suddenly in the midst of a raging universe of hallucination and you are you. And you are who you were before. And it has not in any way inflated, repressed, suppressed, distorted, or skewed anything. You're just saying, aha, wow, mm, I'm really smashed. <laughs> the input is reaching overload, but there must be this core observer who's never overwhelmed. And, and this persists with most of the tryptamines. Now, sometimes it is overwhelmed, but when it's overwhelmed, it's the last thing to be overwhelmed and the first thing to pop back into existence at the end of the period of overwhelmment. So sometimes on ayahuasca, you just lose it for a period of time, 20 minutes or something. But then you reconstruct and you're there like a little cork popping up to the top of the ocean say oh here I am it's me again uh, so this is very important to be able to observe with DMT the reason it's so fascinating is because the input the content seems to be almost entirely confined to the visual cortex it's something that you look at and it comes toward you and it relates to you there is a weird distortion of body image, but it's small potatoes compared to m most of what's going on. And you can maintain this I-thou relationship. So, uh, you know, my, my tastes may be narrower than some people. Some people just like to get, you know, fucked up. <laughs> and they go one way and then another and a few reds and a shot of this and a hit of that. And, yeah.
They could be. They're demonic. They've never done anything bad to me. It's that they're humor. It's like being trapped in a Bugs Bunny cartoon. I mean, we all know how funny a Bugs Bunny cartoon is, but have you noticed that the humor is all based on explosions, falling anvils, and agony? And so imagine if you were actually in a Bugs Bunny cartoon. You know, I mean, it, it's, a, it, it's a parody of, of that situation. I don't know... The vibe of these creatures is very strange. They're knowledge holders. Like I've often thought that what they were was meme traders because they had the same feeling that I associated with the Indian hashish traders. They're meme traders. They are, when they spread out all this stuff in front of you and are saying, look at this, look at this, these marvelous jeweled objects, these are things they are selling. They want to trade. They're asking, what have you got? You know, What can you show us? Your Rolex, your fountain pen, your political beliefs, your sexual orientation. You know, What do you want to trade? And uh, they, they, so they're sort of like cosmic pack rats. You, you know, pack rats will um, take something, but they always leave something. Have you ever dealt with pack rats? Oh, pack rats are fascinating because they, if one finds you, it will leave an object in trade for whatever it takes. And the trick is to work it your way, you know. So you give it a paper clip, it gives you a fountain pen. And there are stories in the gold country of Colorado and California of people having relationships with pack rats where they were trading it thumbtacks and it was bringing them gold nuggets <laughs> until, you know, they had enough gold nuggets that they could leave off trading with varmints and get a life. <laughs> yes. From your experience of other cultures and psychology and have you said, do they always make people kinder and gentler? Do psychedelics always make people kinder and gentler? Do they make us kinder and gentler? Well, that's an interesting question. I mean, as I get older, I ask it slightly differently of myself. I ask the question, you know, if this stuff is so great, you know, what is so great about us? that we're any different from anybody else? Or are we just like holy rollers and rolfers and Taoists and Hasidic Jews and everybody else who thinks they've found uh, the final answer? What is so great about it? Uh, The answer to your question is, I don't think so. Uh, I think of the Yanomama, Yanomami culture, Certainly from the exterior, this looks like a fairly brutal culture. The men, uh, it's the only culture where DMT is a regularly abused drug. And the men uh, blasted up each other's nostrils with these hollow tubes. And then the name of the game is two guys square off. And you plant your feet flat on the ground and the guy who goes first hits the other guy as hard as he can with the flat of his palm in the chest. And the game is to knock the person over. So you absorb this blow, and then it's your turn. And you get up, and you do it. And these two guys, totally loaded, saliva flying to the four winds, will stand and do this till somebody is knocked off their pins. Well, so then you ask them, what's going on here? You know, is this like the Super Bowl? Is this fun for you guys? <laughs> and and they explain that they have demons that live in their chest, and they collect these demons on their psychedelic trips. And the more demons you have, the harder it is to knock you over. So they're doing this thing, but they're also lacerating each other with clubs and this sort of thing. Uh, I think that it's 
fouled up. I have the faith that if you have um, psychedelic religious ritual in combination with group sex in a small tribal group whose economy is based on nomadic pastoralism, that then it will be very, very hard for these people to maintain a neurotic lifestyle. But that if you interfere with any of this, then you'll get anxiety. And so you have psychedelic cultures, but the Yanomamo, this is a culture of male dominance and sexual anxiety and, uh, you know, a lot of uh, tweaked stuff. But I think that that the... uh, main thing is to be that the cultural group must take the psychedelic frequently enough that the ego does not form and that the specific manifestation of ego that you want to watch out for is concern for male paternity that once it's gone that far it's lost and then because then there's male male rivalry for women and and territory yeah. I'd like to go back to the, the Irish elves for a second. Um, uh, my wife came across an article. She's Irish and um, came across an article last year drawing a loose connection between the ancient sweat houses and the uh, possibility of seasonal ceremonial use of shrooms. And we sent you that article. I remember that article. Yeah, I was wondering if you follow that up and I, uh, in light of your having written the introduction to the, the Celtic faith in, or the fairy faith in Celtic countries well it would be very interesting to prove psilocybin use in ancient Ireland it, that <coughs> people who have been to places like Ionia and like that say they're just overrun with mushrooms and yet it's not explicit in any Celtic source. Um, there's a lot of psilocybin in Europe. I mean, I was surprised. I thought that it occurred rarely, and so you could make the argument that it was possibly there. But last year when I did a speaking tour of Germany and we were from Hamburg clear down to Munich and into Switzerland, Everywhere there were mushrooms. And we would talk like we're talking here and then have lunch recess and people would come back two hours later with small grocery bags full of these things. Well, I don't understand the peculiar... uh, There must be something we don't quite grok about why the mushroom image is taboo. Maybe because it looks like a penis that doesn't really sound right to me. But why is it so rarely portrayed in all these areas where it must have been used? For instance, in the northwest coast of Oregon and Washington, there are something like 22 indigenous species of psilocybe, no anthropological record of mushroom use by the northwest coast Indians who were clearly paying attention. I mean, when you look at their carving and painting, they were paying attention. Where is the record of the mushroom use? In ancient Ireland, this and throughout the Celtic area, into Germany and Bohemia, no visible use of mushrooms. In the in the culture of old Europe that Maria Gambutis talks about, again, a prohibition of the image. So this is puzzling, not not easy to understand. I would like to believe that in Africa 15,000 years ago, the the primary religion of humanity was goddess-worshipping pastoralism based on sacramental use of mushrooms. But again, the physical evidence is just a few petroglyphs, drawings on stone, and uh, it hasn't been, it isn't a strongly proven case, so it's not well understood. It's hard to believe that the Irish weren't mixed up in this somehow. I mean, it seems so basic to the Irish uh, soul. Yeah. How many grams of mushrooms do you recommend taking? Five dried grams. 
and you should weigh it. You should invest in a little scale and weigh it because people eyeball it and they inevitably choose much less than is the correct amount. And if you're taking fresh mushrooms, you should take like 60 grams, you know, because it dries down by a factor of more than nine to one. You're referring to uh, cubensis? Cubensis. We're always talking about Stropheria cubensis because that's the one people cultivate. The, some of the wild ones are stronger, can be taken in smaller amounts. But I think it's good to take Stropheria cubensis because then you know what you're getting because it's, so you know, some of these uh, small psilocybes look physically very much like Gallerina species that have irreversible liver destructive toxins in them. So if you eat a Gallerina, you'll have a very bad experience or maybe a very good experience, but none of us will ever know. Uh, how, speaking of mushrooms, how about the uh, Amanita mus- muscaria? I've heard both from uh, well, this is a very controversial mushroom uh, that occurs worldwide. You all know this mushroom, the red one with the white dots on top of it, the toadstool of European mythology. Uh, it's used in Siberia and places like that as an intoxicant, and Gordon Wasson thought that it was the basis of soma but it now looks like it probably isn't the basis of soma and that it's very variable, seasonally variable, geographically variable, genetically variable. So you never know what you're going to get. It's very hard to obtain a reliable, desirable intoxication from that mushroom. It's another one of these. There are a lot of these things that are sickening and distorting and that after you've gone through a night with them, you feel reborn because you're so damn glad you lived through it. <laughs> but they're not really psychedelic, you know. Any other I questions? I say something before about this idea about the, the, the dead ancestors. Oh, yeah, what about... I, I saw a um, man recently, some New Age magazine, that stated just because they're dead doesn't mean they're smart. And actually had an IQ test that you could do it. <laughs> to, to an IQ test to your ancestors? So that most of the entity has been channeled. <laughs> well, that's great. We've needed that for a long time. Just the simple test for gram- grammatical correctness would eliminate. <laughs> the other thing I was going to say was that I've had some experience with ketamine, and I did not find it at all distorted my central observer self, the way you talked about the turret. And um, I think at the height of a DMT trip, you wouldn't be able to do much with the fire in the house either. I mean, when you, when you take when you take a psychedelic that powerful, ketamine or DMT, you make sure you put yourself in a situation where you don't have to worry about physical surroundings. True. But but the thing that I noticed about ketamine is the first thing that happens is you stop worrying. The very first thing before there's any manifestation of any symptom whatsoever, you get this kind of, oh, what the hell? And that's the sign that it's beginning, but it's also the sign that you're not paying attention like you should. The first couple of times I did, I was profoundly scared that I was dying. Well, I think it also depends on the dose. How much did you do? Um, 50 milligrams to 100 milligrams. Yeah, well, see, I didn't do it that many times, and each time I did it quite a bit. And it was reality obliterating for sure. I've noticed that people who get into ketamine tend to dose downward rather than upward, tend to settle in somewhere around 50. And... This is probably, I shouldn't even be speaking about it because I don't know what 50 is like. I know what 150 is like. Uh, With the DMT, the main thing is, at first you think, my God, how could anyone ever retain or remember any of this? But it's really that you have to learn to control your own astonishment that that it's like having a heart attack of wonder. And after you've had the experience three or four times, you just learn to be cool. 
you say, you know, I am not going to give way to a bunch of exclamations about how amazing this is. And then, and they tell you to do that. They say, don't start raving about how amazing it is. <laughs> Pay attention to what we're doing. We know that you're blown out. We know that you're amazed. Yes, yes. Now, pay attention to this. And then they try to convey this linguistic thing, this visible language. And I don't understand, you know, um, what this is all about. Has this always been what they've tried to convey? Is the message always the same? Is there a new urgency about visible language? Or is it, you know, how much of the message is already present in me? Is it a message tailored for me? Like this question of whether or not these things are ancestors. Then you get into questions like, what ancestors are they? Like, I do not feel when I break into the DMT space that this is my dead mother or my grandparents. I feel that it's more, that it's just sort of local spirits. Grandma became a self-transforming Yes, who, who would have thought? Uh, a little white-haired old lady. Uh, and, and then sometimes I think that the reason it's so hair-raising is because the chief soul in this weird place is actually your soul. And that the hair-raising aspect is it's not just any dead person or a dead relative, it's you dead. And that's the one thing that causes the whole thing to shimmy and fall apart and go into a tailspin of cognitive dissonance. When you realize that the entity you're dealing with is yourself, beyond the grave, then you just flood out in the amazement, wonder, horror, and disbelief department and, uh, and lose the focus and come down. Back here. Yes. Small people. Well, five, when, five grams is what I think would destroy most of the resistances of a 145-pound person. A person who weighed 90 pounds could take far less, but a person who, took, who, wore, who weighed 90 pounds who took five grams should be in no uh, physical danger. Uh, it is, you can play with it. But at higher doses, it gets stranger and stranger and stranger and stranger. I mean, anything above eight, you're definitely a pioneer as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> but you're, it's a good point. If you weigh 90 pounds, you maybe don't want to chow down on five grams right on the get-go. But the key is to do more rather than less because... Uh, Otherwise, you can miss the point, you know. Did you say something about that? Because I, I know I've had numerous trips on different substances where I felt like I took too little and it was almost more horrifying than if I just knocked myself over. Yeah, well, I think where the trouble comes is in the sub-threshold doses where you're neither fish nor fowl and you're thrashing around in it and you get into these loops of psychological... Uh, abrasive psychological self-examination and stuff like that. And what you want to do is you just want to blast through all that. It's hard. Can you sing through that? Yeah, you can sing so through that's that. that's one of the things that you use to sing through. Uh-huh. Like yeah. Mm -hmm. Singing and cannabis are my techniques, and together I seem to be able to move it around. You mentioned that you uh, do mushrooms alone in the dark. Uh, what is the effect of being with people uh, who are either observers or participants in the... Uh... Oh, well, for me, I mean, I'm... You have to understand, I mean, I'm a double Scorpio and a kind of reclusive type anyway. Uh, the reason I don't particularly like tripping with people is because I just worry. 
I'm a worrier. And if I'm stoned and somebody else is stoned, then I worry. And I listen to their breathing and I wonder and I wonder how they're doing and I wonder if I should ask how they're doing. And I I just lose all spontaneity and I become completely the victim of my imagined concern for this other person. Well, then if they're... And then the other thing that happens is people are the weirdest objects in the universe. And if you're stoned and you come upon another person stoned, I mean, they can just unleash something you could never have imagined or conceived of. Uh, I remember, um, I think I learned this lesson the hard way in India, but years ago, once at Sarnath, and it happened many times, but this was typical. Sarnath is the place where the Buddha taught his first sermon after attaining enlightenment. He walked from Bodh Gaya to Sarnath. So I took mescaline there with these two women who were friends of mine, and it's all nicely green and sculpted. And we were sitting there under a tree, and I swear, you know, 500 yards away, there were these two Indian guys walking across my field of vision. And I was sitting there, and I was loaded, and I was watching the traceries. And then I looked out across my field of vision, and I saw these two, in- these two Indian guys stop dead in the center of my field of vision. And then they said something to each other, and then they turned 90 degrees. So they were now facing me, and they began walking toward me and I was horrified and I looked down I said I can't I was so horrified that I said I can't believe this is happening I refuse to believe this is happening I will just look at the ground in front of me like this so I started looking at the ground in front of me and I looked and looked and looked and looked until two pairs of brown feet appeared in my field of vision and then I looked up at these guys and they, they had caught the vibe and they wanted to know what was going on. And uh, several experiences like this caused me to believe that you, know, you should really bury it deep before you take it into public. The other thing I've noticed is you know, if you're stoned in a confined space, there's a certain amount of control of synchronicity. I mean, there's rustling in the corners and batting at the windows and so forth, but this you can handle. But if you take it out into public, God, it's just uh, absolutely uncontrollable. I mean, you could be struck by a meteorite. You could be abducted by extraterrestrials. A safe could fall on you. Anything could happen because the statistical disruption of ordinary probability is so great. What did you tell us? What did I say? Oh, I remember what I said. I looked up and I said, I cannot be interrogated. It was good, but it didn't work. <laughs> See, how long have you been in this place? You're coming from which place? No, uh, what I found in India was pe- people were telepathic, but it didn't make them like you any better. It, it just gave them a fantastic kind of, of in. But I think group psychedelic taking is very promising and people who can do it, groups that can do it and stick with it over years, log amazing experiences. But it's very hard because what immediately emerges if you have a group of people doing this stuff is it it will veer off in some weird direction. One person will get a quote-unquote funny idea And then the funny idea, everybody polarizes for and against the funny idea. And then they have to decide, well, you know, they're losing, so-and-so's losing their mind. They're in too deep with this. Say, no, no, this is the answer. And we're moving. And just, you know, and quickly cognitive dissonance builds up. And it's very, very hard. I have a correspondent in the Midwest, a group of psychiatrists who over six years took mushrooms once a month together and they went through amazing 
contortions of wife trading and not speaking and speaking and denouncing and embracing and just because they were, you know, because it just unleashes this stuff and then it crawls around. So I prefer to do it by myself and then, you know, get all combed and pinned back together before I present myself uh, to the troops in the morning because, you know, in the height of the thing, you could proclaim anything. Do <laughs> you think it's possible for a group of people who have been fairly experienced with psychedelics to get together wanting to do this uh, very wonderful group uh, Work? telepathic thing? And to and to create uh, what they think, at least to try to anticipate what might be things that would pull it apart, that would unplug one. It's hard to anticipate. I mean, I've really found that the way the mushroom works is it reads you perfectly, much better than you can read yourself, and then it comes at you with the one thing that you are vulnerable to. And because it knows you like an open book and, uh, and can lead you practically any direction that it wants. But I think group work is interesting and should be pursued. And couple work is very interesting and should be pursued. I'm very conservative. I mean, my approach to it is I basically turn it on and then I back off and watch that's all I ever do. And I've seen... I don't have a magical mentality. I don't want to get something or take control of someone or a situation for good or ill. But people who do make great progress in all of these areas, you know. I mean, people who want to design electronic circuits or play Bach on the piano... Uh, but I don't do anything. I'm interested kind of in the essence of the thing, what it is, the ding on sish, the thing in itself. And that's why I don't listen to music. This horrifies some people. So you don't listen to music? No, I mean, I have listened to music. I know what it does to music. It makes it the best thing in the world. But without music, it also can do that. And so I don't, I sit in silent darkness and I maintain that's where, you know, the essence of the thing is. Then it's not colored by sound or light or, uh, or expectation. It, I'm trying to see beyond the mask, see what this thing is in itself, for itself. Anybody else, anything else? You mean in terms of in the proximity to the trip? A lot of people like to fast. I don't particularly say you should fast. I just say you should have an empty stomach. Five hours without eating is good. You should just be cleaned out, you know, bring a certain amount of attention and respect to it and... uh, and it's very, very kind to beginners. The complexity comes later in, this, in, the, in the unfolding of the kinks of the personality. But I think it's very gentle to beginners. What's the ayahuasca diet? You mean, actually, what does it consist of? It's... Uh, no sugar, no alcohol, no salt, sexual abstinence. It's basically a diet of manioc and certain fish, and I don't think many greens. Is that it, Ken? Bananas, plantinos. It's probably analyzed nutritionally. It's probably a a serotonin-loaded diet because of the large amount of of plantinos in it. But it's a bland diet. It's just setting you up uh, to be sensitive, I think, to the uptake of the alkaloids. That's an MAO inhibiting... Yes, ayahuasca works through inhibition of MAO. 
good point. You see, uh, normally DMT would be destroyed in the gut, but if you inhibit monoamine oxidase somehow, then it passes through the gut and is absorbed and passes into the blood. This was not known by Western pharmacology until the mid-1950s, but it's always been known in the Amazon. So the strategy, you see what ayahuasca is, really, is a slow-release DMT trip where you take a plant that contains DMT and you combine it with uh, an MAO inhibitor, and then when you take these together... uh, the DMT slowly releases and you get the equivalent of a DMT flash but stretched out over about an hour and a half. And so you can watch it more carefully. And some people say, you know, that I overstress the visual side of things, that all kinds of things go on on psychedelic drugs. Insights, uh, conceptual breakthroughs, Uh, weird distortions of body image and this sort of thing. And this is all true, but to my mind, the visual thing is the most striking because it is so other. It is so highly organized, so demonstrably the product of intelligence. I mean, it's not a feeling, some weird feeling, uh, you know, nausea or su- subthreshold poisoning or all of these things. These are feelings. But it's simply the release of understanding and visually, somehow visually processed understanding. Ken? In addition to the other three possibilities, the souls of the dead and the extraterrestrial, would you entertain the idea that what we're saying might be simply uh, constructs from the subconscious? Yes, well, that's the other possibility. Carl Jung had this wonderful phrase in talking about elves and fairies, and he said, autonomous psychic components escape from the ego's control and present themselves as independent beings. Well, that's just a a description of a pretty twisted around state of mind. It's the idea, you know, that you see the self in the mirror and then you bring the mirror down and shatter it and suddenly there are hundreds of selves. Each fragment of the mirror reflects a self. This is would be a conservative theory of what these things are, except that they don't look very much like the self. It, the, the shock in DMT is, if this is myself, then I don't know who I am. But, yeah, one thing I've thought of in an effort to explain it is that they are fractally parts of the personality. That an elf is, you know, you put ten elves together and you have a personality or something like that. And so so these elves are literally autonomous psychic components that have broken free from the control of the ego. We say we've fallen to pieces, always talking about the psychedelic as a boundary dissolver. Well, maybe what happens when you smoke DMT is the boundary dissolves so quickly that uh, you can say of the situation, that's me all over because you're literally bouncing off the walls and visible to yourself, the illusion that you are uh, stitched together within a body has been shattered and your several or multiple personality components are jumping around the room. I think the most extreme case of that that I ever saw was uh, once I, I used to smoke, I don't recommend this, but in my vanished youth, I used to smoke DMT. And I smoked the DMT, and it was wild. It went on for a long, long time and was very intense anyway. And suddenly, right in the middle of this trip, 
this woman came back from Easter vacation, came charging up onto the front porch of this house and threw open the front door and ran into my bedroom door and started beating on my door furiously. Well, being a double Scorpio and secretive anyway, I just was like had a uh, heart attack and I jumped off the bed right out of this DMT flash. I jumped out and I landed on my feet in the middle of this room and something about moving so suddenly had like shattered the distinction between the two continua and it, I carried it all into the room with me and so the room was then filled with elves and they were <laughs> hanging off my arms and spinning me around and there was this geometric object in the room that was spinning and clicking and every time it would click it would hurl a plastic chit across the room that had a letter in an alien language (laughs) written on it. And these elves were screaming and bouncing off the walls. This machine was spinning in the air. These chits were ricocheting off the walls. And I was trying to deal with Rosemary in the middle of this. And, uh, you know, it was just, it was a too muchness. It was a case of seeing too deeply into it. And you have, uh, you know, too many of those stacked up and uh, then you become reluctant. And this is why I'm very cautious with it. The notion of having enough chutzpah or will or something to want to try and use this stuff, I can hardly imagine using it I mean my every time I encounter it my wish is to not be destroyed by it and the idea of using it for anything is just seems like blasphemy you know and probably is blasphemy it's probably a good way to get cut to, down to size yeah uh, you know, last night you were talking about how certain times harken back to other times right to this formula and in the beginning of this weekend, you were talking about the archaic revival we're going towards or through. And I thought you were talking about going back to the time of that city in Turkey, you know, that 30,000 years. Chattal yeah. uh-huh. Could you just say a few words about that? I mean, is that connected? Well, no, that's the basic notion that, that somehow our future lies in our past. And shamanism, well, the particular past that I wanted to concentrate on was this period of time after the melting of the last glacier 20,000 years ago and for the 10,000 years following that when there were pastoral populations in Africa and leaving Africa uh, that had developed this ecological balance and this shamanic doorway to nature see at every oh the computer isn't here but at every glaciation um, uh, human populations were bottled up in Africa during the time when the ice pack was thick nobody was getting out but only the last time where the people was pastoralism developed in the intervening period So it was 20,000 years ago, those people leaving Africa were herders of domesticated cattle, and all previous radiations out of Africa had been hunter-gatherers. Yeah, the Minoan civilization, see, Chattalhyuk ended in 6500 BC, but what's interesting is this is when you get the earliest Minoan settlements, and they carry the pottery motifs and building styles of central Anatolia to Crete. So it appears that what happened was Chatalhyoyuk was like the last outpost of this goddess culture. And when these wheeled chariot Indo-European folks came down, uh, the survivors of that actually went to Crete And Crete became this weird um, institutionalized backwater where literally for three millennia 
the fossilized social forms of the previous matrilineal society were kept intact, while on Asia Minor, on the mainland, it all became about kingship, male lines of descent and all that. It wasn't actually until that turning point at the top of the wave in 980 BC that the last vestiges of this goddess culture were were crushed in Crete. And even then, you see the, the strain of mystical, of deep psychedelic mysticism that enters Greek religion is all imported from Crete. The, the northern Thracian strain in Greek religion is rational and airy and oriented toward physical space. But out of Crete came, you know, rites three, four, five thousand years old. And it was always said, even up until classical times, that the rites that were celebrated in secret at Eleusis were celebrated openly at Heracleon and at uh, Gnosis. So uh, that's the connection. My fantasy about all this is, you see, Chatalhyuk represents such an advanced civilization over anything else existing that, and it can be traced back a thousand years to Jericho. The people who built Jericho built a round tower there uh, that was the absolute glory of the engineering world of 8000 BC. And it was a grain storage tower. But then these Jericho people, it's hard to trace where they came from. Uh, What I think happened is that uh, when you look at the stratigraphy of the Nile Valley, you discover that actually there weren't people in the Nile Valley much before 10,500 BC. Then suddenly, these people appear who are called Natufayan, and they build under the overhanging lips of cliffs and have a certain style of fetal burial in a honey pot and certain other characteristics, not to fans, and they appear out of nowhere. Well, anybody who studied them uh, has wanted to connect them to the culture of old Europe that Maria Gimbutas talks about, simply based on the fact that they w- were so culturally advanced that the bias of all these scholars is to say, well, they must have come from the Balkans. But when you look at them as a cultural horizon, you see, um, to my mind, that they are unmistakably African, and that when you go to the Teseli Plateau in southern Algeria, you find the same style of building, of living under the lips of caves, and this same coarse-grained black pottery called Sudan, Sudanese ware. The, the pottery, the animal motifs, the fixation on the vulture, the jackal and the cow, these are all African animals that occur at Chatal, seems to suggest that there was actually a sweep of African civilization and out of Africa into the Middle East around 10,000 BC. And these people built Jericho a thousand years after that and settled southern Anatolia a thousand years after that. Well, this is... Uh, what this suggests then is that you could go out to the Teseli Plateau with sufficient resources and conduct an archaeological survey and the ultimate payoff in this fantasy is that you would unearth the archaeological equivalent of Eden. In other words, you would discover the Ur spot from which the Chatal civilization came, the site of this mushroom-using goddess cattle uh, civilization. And when you read the accounts of the Teseli Plateau, there's every reason to think that this strategy would work. It's a windswept uh, sandstone escarpment, 
and Henri Float, who did the preliminary exploration out there, said that in these arroyos where the sand has been cleared away by the wind, there would be Neolithic stone chippings and detritus, sometimes up to half a meter thick, indicating, you know, thousands and thousands of years of continuous habitation when this was all uh, uh, green. There is an enormous unexcavated tell out there that has never been dated, that is just carried on the archaeological surveys as presumed pre-Islamic. It's enormous. So digging out there might be very uh, a very useful thing to do. It's from that area that we get these 9,000-year-old images of shamans with mushrooms sprouting out of their bodies, shamans carrying mushrooms over their heads and running in long uh, chains with strange geometric uh, uh, motifs trailing along beside them. So uh, it would be a kind of recovery. I think archaeology will play a big role in the archaic revival that part of our cultural dilemma and our political infantilism comes from the fact that we don't know any history. So we're easily led. I mean, we don't even really understand the history of the 20th century. I mean, you know, there are... You ask somebody who Joseph Goebbels was, and they think he served in the Nixon cabinet. I mean, and so it, hardly to speak of who was Suleiman the Magnificent and just exactly what was Frederick Barbarossa's role in European history and so forth and so on. But recovering this is like waking up gaining control. And you know, I said yesterday, it's only been 1500 generations of people that have walked us into this dilemma. But uh, the, the archaic revival is a huge paradigm shift. You can imagine, remember the example I gave about the shift from the Renaissance, or from the medieval to the Renaissance, which really was a giving up of the universal power of the church, the philosophical certitude of giving your allegiance to the Holy Father in Rome and setting out into, you know, the pure existential universe. I mean, Marcello Ficino said man is to be the measure of all things. Well, this sounds like old hat in 1990, but in 1480, you know, this was such a dizzying notion uh, that uh, it can hardly be imagined. You know, Giordano Bruno went to the stake, was burned at the stake for insisting that the universe was infinite in all directions. You know, he said, no, the stars and planets go on to infinity. And they just said, you know, this is off the wall. Only a demon could inspire a thought like this. Uh, But the transition that we're asked to make That was a transition you see from the certitude of dogma to secular existentialism. The transition that we're being asked to make is somewhat similar, but to my mind, deeper, more challenging, more profound. It's the shift from uh, scientific certitude, scientific certitude, to a complete embracing of non-closure to actually begin it's a kind of maturity you know what we're being asked to do is to grow up and realize that you know there ain't no free lunch there aren't always happy endings not every story ends with the german shepherd running in and licking grandpa's face and everybody laughing and so forth and so on you know hard truths uh And this lack of closure thing, I mean, I feel it in myself. And I assume, you know, that ontogeny recapitulates and so forth. So that, you know, the struggle to become a real um, human being is the struggle to give up having it actually make any sense, ultimately. 
where I think it was, of all people, Robert Frost who said, uh, the secret of a happy life is learning to enjoy people you don't approve of. Well, you know, there's something. Uh, there's what that means is you're surrendering to life. You're just saying, you know, it's bigger than I am. I may not like drag queens, but there they are, and I should get used to it. I should make the adjustment. This kind of thing. In other words, uh, recognizing the complexity of the situation. And science has been like a long, centuries-long bender to exercise precisely, exorcise precisely this kind of uncertainty from life. And, you know, to reduce it all to, to uh, uh, atoms blindly running under the control of mathematically describable fields of force. The problem is... Um, all the higher order phenomena, so, uh, sociological, political, aesthetic, uh, human organizational, got shoved off to one side and just sort of festered there for a long time while technology perfected itself, um, mass production, mass media, information transfer. But the human dimension lagged and now there is this tremendous um, imbalance between like the technological descriptive power of the culture and its moral and ethical power to direct itself toward any kind of rational goal. Well, when this happens in a society or even in a personality, you know, you can sort of make a Jungian model of this, you get what's called compensatory phenomena or at least that's what it used to be called, means eruptions of material from the unconscious that is organized and constellated like a message, like an attention-claiming thing. Uh, in a person, in a personality, it ruptures as a symptom. It may be an attention-getting symptom to then bring other people into the caregiving loop or something like that. In a society like our own, a scientific society, it takes the form of, of uh, the irrational, the irrational appearing in strange forms. Uh, a good example of this in the past is the birth of Christianity in the center of uh, the late uh, Roman Empire or the early Middle Roman Empire. Uh, where, you know, the people who were administering the world at that time were Romans educated by Greeks who were Epicurean atomists, not Platonists, not followers of Heraclitus or Pythagoras or any of the flashy folks we're into. They were Democritean atomists, rationalists, materialists, would have been very comfortable in a modern uh, chemical engineering company. And they, they could not conceive uh, that the irrational could hold any threat to their world. Meanwhile, they had dark-skinned servants in the kitchens and in the gardens, Jews, Greeks, Phoenicians, people brought from the Eastern Mediterranean. And among these people, specifically the Jews, this rumor began to tear loose about a Galilean politician who had somehow tweaked the Romans and then risen from the dead. Well, any Roman administrator listening to uh, his illiterate cook or gardener babble out this story would just, you know, think, these folks is getting stranger every day. <laughs> But what was actually happening, you know, was a message was being enunciated which within 50 years would be hammering at the gate, well, make it 90 years, would be hammering at the gates of Rome with all the power of an invading army. Uh, in a similar way, the kinds of eruptions from the unconscious that characterize the 20th century are trying to serve a similar function. Uh, the 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 uh, well i don't know where you want to put it but like for instance the eruption of the beast man 
in the episodes of persecution that happened in Europe during the 20th century, persecution of Jews and gypsies and Slavs. Uh, this you know, was tremendously shocking to the sensibilities of so-called civilized people because people said, my God, we thought that ended with Frederick Barbarossa or we thought that ended with Nero. How can 20th century people, the neatly clipped and manicured cities of prosperous intellectual Germany, how could it spawn a thing like this? Well, you know, the answers are complex and multi-leveled, but on a, from a very broad perspective, what is happening is the unconscious is erupting into history, leaping onto the stage of history, claiming the undivided attention of people in a way that surrealism, which was a limp-wristed artistic movement by comparison to fascism, never could. Similarly, uh, you know, you get that under control. The beast is supposedly suppressed by making notice a pact with a greater beast that a demon can be summoned from the heart of matter with the purpose of wasting the cities of Germany. But then it arrives too late for that, but then it's good for the Japanese. So it's this, uh, it's this um, opera about how evil begets greater evil and people are reaching for ever greater weapons. Then uh, the, the, this, the intrusion of the atomic bomb into history sort of halts that cycle. Everyone stands back and goes for a middle-class existence, and suddenly the skies of the planet are filled with the craft of uh, meddling extraterrestrials who are obligingly dying in the desert and turning up on blocks of ice for Eisenhower to inspect, and all, you know, this whole crazy story. Well, w clearly what this is, is, you know, the unconscious will not go away in the 20th century. Now the wheat fields of England lay down in hieroglyphic patterns to uh, try and shake awake uh, uh, the dreaming primates. It's as though the whole of nature, you know, is infused with a linguistic intent to communicate. I mean, I think this is one of the things you learn on, uh, on psychedelics, that everything has a story Everything has a lesson, and it's not abstract or remote or removed. I mean, to the degree that you can hold your ego aside, nature can teach you almost anything you want to know. I mean, you can learn uh, hydrology by staring into a mud puddle, you know. I mean, it is all happening right there. Uh, but ego is a very subtly interfering factor. I always think, you know, in, in my own experience at one time in the Amazon when I was at my most illuminated, I could walk into the jungle and invite butterflies to come down and settle on my outstretched hands like St. Francis of Assisi, you know. And... And I would do this and, and it would bring tears of joy and affirmation to my eyes and, and then it would go on and on and the tears of joy and affirmation would clear from my eyes and in the midst of this pure unadulterated ecstasy, a tiny thought would form which was, wouldn't it be nice to show this to somebody else so they could see how great I am? <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> so then, you know, dismiss the butterflies, scurry back to the camp, gather up a skeptical colleague, bring them back to the clearing and march out into the clearing with outstretched hands to just have nothing happen <laughs> except people just turn away <laughs> in just... My God, you know, what an embarrassment you've become <laughs> that it's all going to end like this. Better you should be eaten by termites. <laughs> it's a better story. So, you know, it's weird. I mean, Tao is like that. You can't push it. You can't use it. Somebody asked me once, was I worried that 
the mushroom could be used for evil somehow. And actually, early on, this occurred to me, and I put it to the mushroom, and it basically said, you know, it, it, you can't grasp it. It isn't even there if you have wrong intent. You can't even perceive it. It's very uh, selective. And it must be so, because one of the puzzles for me being in the communication business is, is how it spreads, how the tree of information spreads, where it's tolerated, where it's repressed, where it's embraced. It's very interesting. You may have noticed mushrooms get extraordinary good press or none at all. Uh, even in the height of drug war hysteria, the image of mushrooms is largely neutral, unformed in any direction, otherwise viewed as rather comical, harmless, humorous. Uh, com- it is somehow hardwired into our consciousness, connected into an archetype that we are inherently friendly toward as primates. Probably this has to do with this deep food programming that went on for a long, long time. We literally cannot bite the hand that feeds us. So we have a kind of intellectual blind spot to this. Nevertheless, of course, it is a highly repressed Schedule I drug uh, viewed in the same category as heroin, cocaine, and what have you. This is because it has, quote-unquote, no... uh, uh, recognized medical application. You know, I don't know. It depends on what you think of as mental health. I would argue that it, it's an enzyme for the imagination, without which, uh, as the sign says on the blackboard, you're not yourself. I don't know who wrote that up there, but they must have heard an old, old tape of mine. This was a graffiti on a wall in Cali, in Colombia. Without this, you are not yourself.